You would be astounded how many Christians there are that have a misconception about God's love. They believe that God loves them when they're doing well and doing good things, but on the other hand, when they fall into sin, they've got some very serious doubts about God's love towards them. God, thank you for the broadcast today, and thank you for the most important subject matter. I commit the broadcast to you today, and I pray, God, that you would use it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this book of Philippians we're discovering is an astounding book. The Apostle Paul is giving us a prime example of what a true disciple is all about. Apostle Paul is in the city of Rome. He's under house arrest. He's already stood before bloody Nero in his first trial and nobody stood with him. He stood alone. But Paul says, the Lord didn't forsake me. He was with me. Here he is in his rented quarters in Rome under house arrest for a capital offense. And he knows in his heart, bloody Nero is not going to allow this ringleader of the Nazarenes, this Christian, to go free. Now you would think, in light of the fact he's facing death under house arrest, all of his friends have abandoned him, that he would be a very gloomy, depressed man. Huh. No. Huh. On the other hand, we discover that the Apostle Paul has learned the great secret of contentment. It wasn't to be found in any of his circumstances, because his circumstances were all negative and bad. His joy was to be found in the Lord Jesus alone. That was the secret of contentment. He's the man that wrote the book of Romans, and he told the Romans all day long we're counted as sheep to the slaughter. Don't be surprised about the fiery trial that has come to try you to test your faith, Simon Peter says. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul says we're counted as sheep to the slaughter, but listen, we're more than victors. We're more than victors over him and through him that loved us. Paul was not under the circumstances. He was on top of the circumstances. He was a rejoicing, happy, content man, despite the difficulties he was experiencing. Now the Apostle Paul writes a letter. He sends it back by the hand of Epaphroditus, who is apparently the, one of the elders, or maybe even the uh, pastor, the church at Philippi. And uh, that letter made it back to the little church of Philippi and and Apostle Paul is exhorting them and telling them, listen, look at me as an example. Look at me as an example. And, and by the way, he says, listen, here's what I want things to be like. Verse 14, I'm going to cover it just a little bit. We looked at it a little bit last time. Let me go into a little bit better, more detail today. Verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. No grumbling in the ranks. The Jewish people came out of the land of Israel, out of the land of Egypt, rather, they had something called a mixed multitude with them. And who in the world with a mixed multitude? Half Israeli, half Egyptian, who knows what. But they were the first ones to fall into complaining and grumbling. <laughs> and by the way, every church has got a mixed multitude there. They're always complaining. They don't like the preacher's sermons. They don't like this. They don't like the other thing. And by the way, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The Bible says the righteous should choose their friends carefully. Don't hang out with a grumbling, miserable, long-faced, gloomy Christian because you'll very soon become just like him. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Why, Paul? Am I complaining, Paul says? God's in control of all circumstances. In all things give thanks, it says in the last chapter of the book of Philippians. Give thanks in all things, not some things. Paul could give, give thanks in the fact that he was in chains. Paul could give thanks in the fact that he was going to face Nero again and quite likely lose his life because he knew that a loving God was in total control and he had abandoned himself, abandoned himself to the love 
and control of his heavenly Father. Now Paul says, don't be complaining or disputing. And then he says this, holding forth the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Now notice he says, holding fast, not forth. If he said holding forth the word of life, he would be talking about preaching the gospel. But Paul says to this Philippian church, holding fast the word of God. There's a distinction. You show me a church that is wobbly about the scripture, I'll show you a church that's on its way downhill. You show me a preacher that won't preach about hell because he has some doubts in his own mind about it, whether it really exists. Maybe he's been reading books by Rob Bell or other merchant church uh, leaders that question the existence of hell. Show me a preacher who questions the authority of God's word, and I'll show you somebody that is the head of a church that's going in the wrong direction. Paul says, holding fast the word of life. You know, it's interesting, just before the American Revolution, there was a great preacher by the name of George Whitfield. <laughs> and George Whitfield wasn't welcome in the Anglican church, so he didn't preach in churches. He chose the great outdoors to be his cathedral. <laughs> and thousands of people flocked to hear this wonderful evangelist. He traveled all over New England preaching the word of God. Benjamin Franklin used to follow him around and listen to his preaching. And one day a friend of Benjamin Franklin came to him and said, Franklin, why do you listen to George Whitfield? You don't believe one word that he says. You don't believe a word he says. And Benjamin Franklin said, you're right, I don't. But he believes every word that he says. George Whitfield preached with authority and power because he believed what he was preaching. And that brought a little bit of discomfort to Benjamin Franklin. At least I hope it did. He, after all, is the man that said that God helps those that help themselves. I wouldn't want to be standing at the judgment seat of the great white throne and be accountable for saying that little terrible statement. Hopefully he came to Jesus before he, was before he died. George Whitfield believed the word of God. He spoke it with authority. The thing that made Jesus different, the people said, he teaches as one having authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees that squabble over the word of God and don't really believe it. Jesus believes it, and he spoke with authority. The Lord Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. He had a high, high view of God's word. And why shouldn't he? He wrote it. <laughs> and by the way, you might find it interesting that the book of Moses, Pentateuch, was written 1,500 years before Jesus was born. And Jesus quoted out of the book of Deuteronomy. He quoted out of the book of Genesis, believing in a Genesis account, literally. Believed in Noah, Noah's flood believed in Jonah, took every word of God literally. And by the way, he didn't, you'll probably note in the scripture, make a comment, you know, they got this one wrong. The scribe made a little error in the translation I'm reading, Jesus might have said, because that's not the way I wrote it. After 1,500 years, there's a little corruption in the scripture. He never said that, not once, because there was no corruption. God had overseen, overlooked his word to make sure that we got something pure and undefiled. You pick up the Bible, you can trust it, my friends. God wrote it. Now, holding fast the word of life, Paul says, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not labored in vain, Yes, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. That's verse 17. I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason that you also be glad and rejoice with me. Even if I die in Rome, it's like a little bit of a sacrifice for your folks' faith. Because you are going to be able to, you are going to be able to testify to the fact that I didn't uh, cave in when bloody Nero threatened me with death and gave me an option to go free or to stop preaching the word of God or to die. 
I kept the faith. And you can tell your friends and you can tell lost people, the Apostle Paul had every opportunity to escape death, but he didn't choose that option because that was a wrong thing to do. Jesus gave him the grace to say the right thing and to die a death that is honoring to him. That's Paul's thought there. Now we discover from verse 25 down to verse 29, a little bit of personal testimony about Epaphroditus, the pastor of the Philippian church, and Timothy. I'm going to read. Yet I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministers to my need. In other words, I'm sending him back to you, Paul says. And by the way, thank you for sending him to me. You're the only one to send a love gift to me in prison. And I'm, I, I, I take that to heart. Epaphroditus, identifying with a, almost a convicted criminal, took his life in his hands. Thank you. What a sacrifice this man made. And what a sacrifice the church at Philippi made. Caesar could have sent a whole contingency of soldiers down there and slaughtered everybody in that church because he knew that Epaphroditus was their messenger. Listen to this now. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, and indeed he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy upon him, and not only on him but me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I send him the more eagerly that you may see him again and may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. Paul says, you know what? He not only took his life in his hands by identifying with me, but he was sick. He came down with some kind of a terrible disease. Long journey from Philippi to Rome. Picked up some germs maybe along the way. And he was, well, he was desperately ill. But God had mercy upon him and raised him up. At least you be sorrowful and I be sorrowful. God was gracious. So I'm sending him back to you. How wonderful. Then he mentioned Timothy serving as a son with his father. Timothy, only one that cared for the church. Nobody else cares for your spiritual state. How sad. How sad indeed. Apostle Paul must have felt almost abandoned at this juncture. But you know what? He's totally on top of it. He understood men. He understood him perfectly. Chapter 3. Here's his admonition. Not just to the Philippian church, but to every church and to you and to me. Listen to Paul speaking. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Find your contentment in him. We're living in a fallen world. You may not have difficulties today. You're going to probably have them soon down the road. And when we don't have problems, it seems quite short-lived. As Job said, man is destined for difficulties, just like sparks fly upwards in a, in a fire. It's inevitable. Don't look to circumstances to base your happiness upon. Look to the Lord Jesus and trust him alone and rejoice in him alone, knowing he will be with you every inch of the way. After all, he's promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> How about them apples? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus lives inside of our body, temple of the Holy Spirit. He's come to reside there and be with us forever. Can we not trust him? Will he not take care of us? Why then do we worry ourselves to death? <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord, <laughs> Paul says. Listen to this. Then he says, For to me to write to you the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now the Apostle Paul is going to give this most stern warning to the Philippi church. Watch out for long-faced, gloomy legalists. They're going to come into your assembly, 
They're going to preach a message contrary to the one that I preached to. Apostle Paul is fearful that the Philippian church is going to fall into the same problem the Galatian church fell into. The Galatian church, they turned to God from idols to worship God, and they were rejoicing and having a wonderful time in the Spirit, their newborn faith. It was just wonderful. And all of a sudden, Paul left town, had to go on a missionary journey, right in his shadow, these dark, gloomy teachers from Jerusalem came in and said, we have come to teach you the word of God. And by the way, they're saying a little bit more correctly than Paul did. And they got up and preached, oh, Paul said that you're saved by faith. I'm sorry he had to leave town because he would have told you the rest of the story. But listen, the good news is we're going to tell you the rest of the story. You Gentiles, you've got to be circumcised to get to heaven. And you Jewish folks, you didn't think surely that you can get saved and go to heaven by one act of faith in Christ. Are you that naive? Oh, no. You've got to continue on keeping the law of Moses and eating a kosher diet. That isn't a hamburger you're eating over there, is it? Oh, no, no. Put that away, bud. Apostle Paul was fearful that these legalists, these Judaizers would come into the church at Philippi and spoil it. Killjoys is what I call them. Killjoys. This church is rejoicing. Paul said there's a killjoy coming your way. Count on it. He's probably going to come from Jerusalem. He's probably going to be a Jewish Bible teacher, and he's definitely going to have a message that is contrary to the word of God. Watch out. They're going to spoil your rejoicing 100%. Now, do we have this problem in the church today? We do. I think a lot of it is caused by misconception. What kind of misconception? Well, they did a survey of young ladies that belong to evangelical Bible-believing churches, and they asked them a very simple question. When you are doing well, you're going to church, reading the Bible, do you believe that God loves you? Almost 100% of them said, I do. Question number two. When you're doing lousy, when you fall into sin with your boyfriend, and you get away from Bible study in the church, do you believe that God loves you? 75% of them said, no. I don't really believe that God loves me when I'm disobedient to him. Misconception. A misconception about God's love. The Word of God teaches, and I know I'm speaking to people right now that struggle with this issue. The Word of God teaches He loves us with an everlasting love, a love that will never quit. His sins, our sins, have been placed as far as the east is from the west, hidden. God sees us in Christ. It is no, not possible. Let me see if I can word this correctly. If God stopped loving you as a believer, even when you're in sin, he'd have to stop loving his son who's in heaven. Well, how could that be? We are clothed in his righteousness and we're one with him. We have been beautified by what the Bible calls the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. And God is grieved when we sin. God is grieved, but his everlasting love has never changed. I've loved you with an everlasting love. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you are his words to us. God loves us unconditionally. Whether we're good, whether we're bad, God loves us unconditionally. We need to understand that. And by the way, if I'm speaking to a father out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're normal, <laughs> Because even though your children mess up, you don't stop loving them. You might feel sad. You might reprove them. But you don't stop loving them. They're your, they're your children. We're God's children. And if we don't stop loving our kids, how much more so God doesn't stop loving us? We need to get that misconception because when the young ladies or anybody else questions God's love, now they are open for a different message. A message whereby they can make amends. Maybe, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
uh, a little bit of a payback. I could do something to merit God's love somehow. Martin Luther, the very last sermon that he gave in Germany. You know what he said? I am fearful, he said, after I am gone, that the Christians in Germany, the born-again Christians, will drift back to worshiping Catholic. I'm not going to use the word idols, but these um, dead bones and these uh, pieces of the cross and these uh, special little things that they gather in their uh, churches that people... Uh, Worship, basically. You're trying to get some kind of a blessing out of it. If you think, by the way, I'm exaggerating, you can go to Rome today. And if you go to the Vatican, you will notice a very large statue of St. Peter and a large lineup of people waiting to bow down to kiss the feet of Peter. Man is hopelessly religious. And Martin Luther knew that, and he was so fearful. He was going to go back to worshiping all these things, these articles, these artifacts, and all these Silly superstitious things, because that's what it is, superstitious. The false teachers will bring in something that sounds good, but it'll kill your joy. Turn with me to Galatians, the fifth chapter. Let me give you an example of what Paul says to the Galatian church, because this is what he is fearful of happening to the Philippian church. I'm reading from the fifth chapter. Listen to this now. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. When God saved you, he saved you by his grace. No conditions. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You were born into his family. No strings attached. The law came by Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law, the Bible says, is old, antiquated, and ready to fade away. How many churches do you know that insist upon worshiping God on Saturday? Because that, after all, is what the law said. How many churches do you know that insist upon the fact that you get baptized in their denomination or you're not going to go to heaven? Jesus set us free by his grace and he doesn't want us to be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. When a slave was redeemed in the first century, his chains would be taken off. Would it make any sense to put them back on again? <laughs> this is what Paul is saying. Your chains were removed upon your new birth, and now you're going back to laws and rules and regulations. You're putting your chains back on. What are you thinking? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. This is remarkable. If you become circumcised, you have fallen from grace. That's an expression that the Catholics like to use to suggest you've lost your salvation. But that's not the context at all. What Paul is saying is, if you want to go back to being justified by law, keeping the law, then you're out of fellowship with God. You've fallen from his unferreted maybe. You haven't lost your salvation. You've lost your abundant life. You've lost your joy. That's what Paul is saying. Don't be entangled again. If you want to keep the law, Paul says, you've got to keep it all. Listen to the next verse. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law, all of it. You think you can get by with just worshiping on Saturday? You want to keep the law and be justified by it? You got to keep it all. And by the way, better start making your reservations with LL Airlines to go back to Israel because you've got to go there three times a year to keep the law. <laughs> three times, brother. LL would be happy if you kept the law and you thought that you had to keep it. It'd be a, <laughs> a bonanza financially for them. And by the way, don't be eating any shrimp. That's out of the question because that's non-kosher food. <laughs> and uh, don't be eating any offspray either. And if you don't know what that is, maybe you better find out. There's a lot of things you don't know about the law. 
You want to be justified by law? Paul says you better keep the whole shebang. Old, antiquated, ready to fade away. That's the law. Paul calls it a ministry of death. A ministry of death. Why would anybody want to put themselves under a ministry of death? So they could appear quite religious, of course. Beware of legalism, laws, rules, man-made regulations. They're killjoys, every last one of them. Listen to this. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait eagerly for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Paul says, listen, when you got born again, you're a new creation. You're joined to the Lord Jesus. You have a heavenly citizenship. You belong to a totally new realm. No rules, no regulations. Paul says, I threw the law, died to the law, that I might be joined to Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. The child of God is to be ever looking by faith to the Lord Jesus, rejoicing in him, putting no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in rules and regulations, none of that stuff. It's all deadening. And when you do that, God will build you up. He'll sanctify you. He'll change your life. And you will be doing his will. Now, go on back to the third chapter of Philippians. Listen to what else Paul says. Beware of dogs. And by the way, the word dogs, don't think of a little puppy dog here. What Paul has in mind is a wild scavenger, uh, nasty little things, maybe even big things, kind of will snarl at you and uh, bite you and you might get an infected wound. Beware of those, um, those dogs out in the street that are eating garbage. They're dangerous to you, like a wolf. Let's put it that way. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Oh, they don't purport to be evil workers. They call themselves Bible students and Bible teachers, and very often they have PhDs after their name. But if they make up rules and regulations and put you under any kind of bondage, they're evil workers. Then he says, beware of the mutilation. He is uh, actually making fun if you will, of circumcision. Beware of people who want to circumcise you, cut off your foreskin. Mutilation is they're cutting up the gospel. They're slashing it with a knife. This is what they're doing. When you add any kind of works to the grace of God, you've spoiled it. It's no longer grace, according to the book of Romans. You're either saved by grace, or you're not really saved at all. And what does Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tell us? Well, by grace... Are you saved through faith? Not that of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. You'll notice something about people who teach wrong doctrine. They're very, very quick to attract attention to themselves because ultimately that's really what it's all about. Listen to this. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. They think they're religious, Paul says. That crowd that comes down and preaches to Galatians and mislead them and probably going to show up at Philippi, they think they're religious. They don't hold a candle to me. <laughs> Listen to Paul's credentials as far as in the flesh is concerned. Listen to him. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, Jew to the core, of the tribe of Benjamin, 
of the Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, boy, I persecuted the church, boy, I was religious, concerning the righteousness which is the law, blameless, I was one good dude, except he was totally depraved and he didn't know it. And that's what religion does for you. It blinds you to the reality of your own depravity. Paul says, I gave it all up and counted it as loss that I might gain Christ. Those things that they're boasting about, I consider to be dumb. Wow, strong language. Paul was noted for that. That I might be found in him having a righteousness work based on faith and not by the works of the law, a righteousness based on faith. Jesus was everything to him. And his salvation message was the most precious message in the world. It's the only one that gives any hope about anything to lost humanity. He was grieved that people could twist it and pervert it and not allow other folks to teach a pure, clear gospel message. Paul was zealous for the word of God, was he not? <laughs> what a guy. What a man. Well, let me change the subject a little bit. A little scientific information for you today. DNA, something that wasn't known until quite recently was Francis Crick and one other guy that discovered DNA probably only 30, 40 years ago. Atomic microscope, able to look into things and see things we couldn't see before. We discovered DNA. It's a building block of life. It's like a, uh, a master plan of the human body. In every strand of DNA it is. All little intricacies, the color of hair, color of eye, everything. It's a master plan of our body. How sophisticated is this code in the DNA? And I'm saying all these things to show you that things created demonstrate the glory of God. God says the invisible things from Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, so they are without excuse. You took one teaspoon one little teaspoon of DNA, how much information is in that teaspoon? How can, we, how can we liken that and how can we demonstrate how much information God has put in one little teaspoon of DNA? About 20 years ago, I walked into a friend of mine, a place he had a computer store, and uh, CDs had just come out quite recently, and I've been in broadcasting for 40 years, and I used old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. <laughs> that was my first message I made on those. CDs came, C, CDs came out, of course I switched over to that, but I really wasn't aware of how wonderful those CD machines were. Now, now they're antiquated, but even back then, 30 years ago, I went in to see if I could find, get the addresses and phone numbers of people in Fort Lauderdale. I had a reason to do that. And uh, the guy that owned the store said, Jack, I have a CD, I can give you those. Here's the CD, but you know, it's got a lot more than just the city of Fort Lauderdale in it, the phone numbers. And I said, well, what, what's it got on that CD? It's got every phone number, every name, and every address of all Americans with phone, all America, all 50 states. Every person in this country that's got a phone is on that CD. I was astounded <laughs> that they could get that much information on one CD disc. How much information is there in a teaspoonful of DNA? A thousand CDs? No. Hundred thousand CDs? No. A million CDs? No. A hundred million CDs? No. Five trillion CDs. You heard me. Five trillion CDs. Same amount of information on those five trillion is there's one teaspoon of DNA. How wonderful our God is and how complex. Every one of it, a coded words. It's astounding, absolutely astounding. They discovered something remarkable. Alongside the DNA, there's another DNA that comes alongside of it that actually tweets out the old DNA. And what do I mean by that? It causes an adaptation, for instance. Uh, elephants that live in Africa don't have any hair. They don't need it because it's warm. On the other hand, elephants that live in colder climates like in Siberia, they call them woolly mammoths, they have hair. They're both elephants. One's got hair, one doesn't. What's made the difference? They're called alongside of 
DNA has come and turned on and off the switches needed to grow hair on that woolly mammoth so it can adapt to that climate. Why do some people have black skin, some people white skin? Because the adaptive DNA comes along and turns and switches off the ones it needs to, to change so that we can adapt to our climate. How astounding, how wonderful. <laughs> Poor old Charles Darwin, he thought that that was evolution. No, it's adaptation. Big dog, small dog, some have hair, some don't. God has made the DNA to be adapted for the climate, for the conditions that that critter or that human being lives under. How wonderful, how marvelous is our God. It's just astounding, is it not? <laughs> now, let me wrap the message up by saying this. God loves us when we're good. God loves us when we're bad. He has an unchanging love towards us. Don't doubt it for one second. God demonstrates, listen to this verse, memorize this verse. God demonstrates his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If Jesus loved you when you were in your sin and your total rebellion and shaking your fist at him, if you loved you then, would he ever even dream of stop loving you because you slip and fall after you've been saved? I don't think so. He has an everlasting love. He even told his ancient people, yea, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Can a mother forget her suckling child? God says, neither will I forget you. He loves you. You can trust him. Confess your sins to him if you fail. Come back to him. He loves you. He's waiting for you to come. And beware of long-faced, gloomy legalists who will lead you astray with a false gospel. They are killjoys, is what, exactly what they are. Watch out for them because Paul says, be careful. Thank you for watching us today and may the Lord bless you until next time.